Hello, this is chapter eight. We'll be talking about liberation ideologies and the politics of identity. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the politics of identity, particularly with respect to conflict. But we are a very groupish species, as we've talked about before, that we identify with other certain groups that are like us. So what are the common characteristics for liberation ideologies and politics of identity? We all share certain identities, whether it's in social groups or gender groups, ethnic groups. Talk about that, particularly with respect to ethnicity, a little bit more detail in the next lecture. Throughout the world, there are groups because of their religion or their ethnicity, their language, their shared historical experiences. They have been mistreated or oppressed by some other dominant group, so that bonds their identity to a certain degree. Looking at liberation from certain internal restrictions as well, because people are socialized to believe certain things that their group feels like that they have to accept certain conditions. So with shared politics of identity and liberation ideologies, people come together to raise consciousness to confront the, the sources of this oppression, to promote their identity, to transform the structures of oppression Let's talk about several different groups in this section. Let's look at black liberation over the years, particularly since the civil rights movement or just before, particularly since World War II. Two major approaches to black liberation. There was the integrationist or assimilationist theme that was promoted primarily by Martin Luther King, to try to remove the barriers and legal obstacles to their full participation, to be treated as individuals. Martin Luther King took somewhat of a pacifist approach, probably inspired somewhat by Gandhi, perhaps. The separatist or the nationalist approach, which was popularized somewhat by Malcolm X around that same time was to work on building racial pride and have a stronger sense of identity. And in some cases advocate separate homeland, which is since become less of a push for, from this particular perspective. Let's look at that one a little bit more as far as the separatist nationalist section of black liberation. A lot of this still remains with ideas to remove racist thinking that infects the black groups themselves that perhaps warps their psyche being socialized into accepting certain things having to deal with the racial stereotypes as a result self-loathing hating one's own blackness or that Black rage could be vented on themselves to recover the black history, identify with their own his history, and a little bit more of a affirmative outlook on the culture to take control of their own destiny. There's been several examples of this. Nation of Islam, which came into prominence particularly in the 60s with the uh, Elijah Muhammad, there's lots of celebrities that embraced the, the Nation of Islam in America, would change their names. Muhammad Ali, of course, one of the more famous, Kareem, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Bringing a little bit forward, Million Man March back in the 90s that was trying to promote more awareness of the, the lack of progress in civil rights, even though progress has been made. And even in the last 
decade, we've seen more issues come up, particularly with Black Lives Matter movement, the highlighting of the shootings between police officers and black suspects. Looking back to our history of civil rights in 1950 is recently as 1950, of course, that may sound like a long time to a lot of students, but in the context of human history, not very long at all, but at that time, 30 out of the 48 states at that time even had laws that said it was a crime for blacks and whites to marry. These are called anti-miscegenation laws, which simply means well, preventing marriage between blacks and whites. Landmark case in 1967, Supreme Court, Loving versus Virginia, struck down those laws. So again, here we are, civil rights movement and lots of progress made since that time, but even today, still African-American population lagging in various aspects, particularly in economic rights. When we look at the demographics between black population and white populations, continuing inequities, we see shorter lifespans amongst the black population, fewer graduates in both high school and college. Now we're talking about proportionally here, not in actual numbers because clearly white population is considerably larger than the black population. So we're talking about proportionality Blacks are twice as likely to be unemployed. And we see that about 11% of black men between 20 and 34 have either served prison sentences or serving prison sentences. And so this gets into the disproportionality of our, grip of our criminal justice system as well. The idea of reparations goes all the way back to trying to create some sort of remedies for the, the slavery in America. And this is very controversial, as you uh, may have heard. The idea is to provide payments back in the form of several different ways of scholarships, financial aid, no interest loans, things like that. And there are two different sides on the reparations idea here, opponents of reparations claim that there's really no such thing as a collective guilt to American society, primarily that those responsible for slavery have long been dead. Lots changed since then. The norms have changed. The idea of owning another human being is preposterous. But when you look in the, again, in the context of human history, not that long ago, but the opponents would say that not necessarily paying money back directly, but that what is owed is more of a leveling of the playing field, which has been in, attempted in earnest, particularly since the civil rights era, still not there yet. Proponents of the reparations idea note the lingering legacy of the unpaid slavery and that the profits from the immoral institution of slavery have been passed down over the years. So that still makes it relevant to pay some of that back. And there have been some precedents such as post-World War II, Germany paying rep reparations to Jews. So there are some examples of what of it being done before. So that debate will continue and probably depends on which uh, political administration is in power at the time as to what movement might be happening on that. Now let's look at women's liberation, feminism. Women's rights have been slow to evolve. We'll talk about that history a little bit. But even to this day, women being 
socialized into a patriarchal system in which all societies in the world are patriarchal, male dominated. So there's that continual pushback against the patriarchal systems, the sexism of men in charge, the domination of men in charge. Now, the idea here, of course, is not that these liberation, women's liberation movements or feminist movements are not anti-men, but rather to make women more of men's equals. But there's been a long history of preference for men dominating over women, guiding women, going all the way back to ancient Greece, even the New Testament, even the founding of our own country, as well as early scientific principles of evolution. Examples here, obviously, they are products of their time and what types of male-dominated societies that they were socialized in. Nevertheless, some prominent names here that advocated men taking priority over women as far as being leaders. We've made a lot of progress since then in determining how equal our brains are and how equally proficient we are in our cognitive abilities. So we still had a ways to go. The origination of women's liberation goes way back. Abigail Adams was quite popular, had quite a bit of influence on her husband, husband being John Adams, who was the first vice president of the United States, as well as the second president of the United States, one of our founding fathers. So she did have considerable influence on him as well as her popularity, a little bit more awareness of women's rights. But Mary uh, Wollstonecraft, Wollstonecraft, this book, Vindication of the Rights of Women, was considered somewhat of a landmark at the time. Then as we get into the 1800s, the suffragist movement began to lobby for women to vote. So as early as the mid-1800s, there's quite a bit of activity on trying to provide for women to be able to vote. And even after the Civil War, with the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendments, well, those provided for abolishment of slavery and for the right to vote for the former slaves. So not being able to not being denied the right to vote based on race, but yet still women not able to vote. Some prominent names there, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, they were primary influences of this movement. The Seneca, Seneca Falls Declaration in 1848 was one of the suffragists' first major documents that was proposing all men and women created equal. We start to see into this era, there were men that sided with women. We've already talked about John Stuart Mill's influence on political philosophy, political economy and democracy and representation. And he was advocating for universal suffrage around this time, long before it actually came around. Frederick Ingalls, who was Marx's writing partner, also was pro women's rights, and then anti-slavery advocate William Lloyd Garrison was also one of the most prominent figures in the 1800s as far as advocating equal rights for women, particularly at least getting them the right to vote. As we get into the 20th century, it wasn't until 1920 where the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote, and that is called somewhat the, the culmination of the first wave of feminism that took many decades. The suffragists, suffragists into the 1800s up, up until the women's voting rights advocates in the early 1900s. As we get further into the 20th century, it wasn't until after World War II, we started to see some movement again on this. Simone de Beauvier's book, The Second Sex, quite influential for its time and starts to 
bring up this concept of gender, of how gender is a social construction, regardless of what biological sex you're born into. Obviously, that's kind of what starts it, but then you're socialized into these gender roles. You're indoctrinated into these roles, and particularly for women, they are indoctrinated into the lesser roles, the subservient roles with men in charge. Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique in 1963, another big bestseller that took it to the next level, challenges this, this myth of the happy housewife that women are satisfied with the roles that they've been given in life, that they're obligated to serve their husbands and play their subservient role and be happy with it. That was starting to be questioned. So as we see that in the 60s, the women's movement really started to come into full force. And that's what we call the second wave of the 1960s, the women's lib movement, the issues of sexuality, reproductive rights, the pill was invented. Women were starting to also enter the workforce more because of the booming economy. The ideas of male chauvinism were starting to be called out. The double standards for women in competition with males, lots of things were starting to come to the surface to where this next wave of women's rights was really bringing considerable more awareness to how much further women still had to go. There was also somewhat of an offshoot in the 1960s of radical feminism. We even saw somewhat of a divide in the women's lib movement between the radical feminists and the ones that were simply looking more for more equal rights. But the radical feminists came to emphasize the difference between the sexes and put a little bit more focus on women being objectified, women depicted as bodies or objects for men's pleasure, perhaps push back against pornography. Now, this was before the internet, so we're talking about magazines such as Playboy were major targets. The idea of trophy wives were older men, whether it was through divorce. However, a, a man became available again, they were typically looking for younger wives. In the mass media, it was also targeted during this period as we're coming out of the golden age of capitalism where advertising is so instrumental in getting people to consume products. Well, the mass media's use of, of women to sell products was also a target of the radical feminists. In 1972, the Education Amendments Act Title IX also put it into law that protects from discrimination based on sex and education programs. So Title IX is still invoked even today with respect to certain education programs and sports programs as far as women being able to compete equally in these programs. So bring, taking it ahead to a third wave, and that's why there's a question mark there, is that we're not really sure if we're in a third wave. In 2010, we started to see several states rolling back reproductive rights, we're getting a little bit more of a divide, a political polarization again on abortion. More procedures are being put into place for getting abortion, which is making it more difficult for clinics, abortion clinics to stay open or providing somewhat invasive procedures perhaps or education programs in lieu of getting abortion. So the in fairly um, conservative leaning states, we're seeing that. So that's bringing back a little bit of a more of a, a pushback. Title IX was amended again in 2011 to include sexual harassment as one of the provisions that allowed women some recourse. So today, liberal and radical feminists 
you know, aren't quite the same as they were. We're starting to see some common ground here, particularly with the Me Too movement, that sexual harassment, particularly in the workplace, with men using their positions of power that are holding you know, certain powers of employment over women and then using that to, for sexual predate, predation and things like that. Those are getting more attention with the Me Too movement. So we could potentially be in what would be called a third wave. And when you compare the United States to the non-Western world, it's quite a bit different. I mean, the U.S. is considerably more advanced than some areas around the world. Radical Islam is still dealing with this opposition to female education and political rights. There's been fatwas, which are edicts that would uh, that be put out against people that they could be arrested against feminist scholars, for example, or even women who are even going on YouTube or social media to speak their mind or to present themselves in a little bit more feminine or sexual way that are pushing back against subordination to their husbands. So those are areas where women can still find themselves in, in trouble or in danger. In India, there have been some high profile gang rapes. And in one of the cases, the victim was forced to marry one of the rapists because of a, in a male dominated society still tend to put the blame on the women and in some of these societies that are male dominated there is a they threatened by female sexuality so there's quite a bit of male domination and control over over the female sex, sexuality we may have talked a little bit about female genital mutilation in a previous class that's another kind of barbaric practice that male dominated societies use to control the sexuality of women by doing that when they're young girls. In some Middle East countries, the woman that's raped might actually be charged with adultery or even shunned by the community. So the blame is still kind of put onto the woman in, in these cases. Shifting gears here, let's talk about another identity group liberation theology or liberation ideology, in the case, gay liberation, gay liberation, which has made quite a bit of progress just in the last few decades. So that's, this is an example of how liberation movements can move fairly quickly. Now, again, where stigma still exists, we'll, we'll touch on that. But going way back to ancient Greece, same-sex love between equals was somewhat accepted. Now, this doesn't mean that people are are choosing to be gay, which, which we know that that's not how it works. But in this period, it was more socially acceptable to have these relationships, which are between equals, though that was under a different context. And over time, religious doctrines also served to condemn it as unnatural and sinful. And then it got to where it was persecuted and even punished, and even to this day, in some countries, still persecuted and punished for being gay. Looking at England in particular, there was a, an incident with Alan Turing that was quite influential in making some changes back in the 50s in particular, but Alan Turing was a mathematician who was instrumental in breaking the the enigma code which was the the german secret code credited with saving thousands of lives and shortening the, the war by being able to intercept these codes and after the war there was a lot of fear homophobia rules and regulations and laws against homosexual behavior he was actually convicted in Britain in 1952 for having a same-sex relationship and because of the penalties involved he chose castration over going to prison and eventually committed suicide as a result of his anguish and torment in 1954 and then as 
things typically happen in society. In hindsight, British society started to realize how appallingly he was treated. And within a very few short years, a commission was called and it came up with the Wolfenden Report in 1957 that concluded that homosexual acts should no longer be considered a criminal offense. The decriminalization does come rather slowly, but again, in, in terms of societal progress, faster than others. It's 1969, the Stonewall Inn riot is considered somewhat of a defining moment there in New York City that got quite a bit of attention that put a little bit more of a focus or a light on the gay movement and the discrimination that they were dealing with. And in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association takes homosexuality off of the list of mental disorders. So even as recently as 1996, Congress passed a Defensive Marriage Act, which defined marriage between man and a woman. So there was still some discrimination against gay marriage. But it wasn't until 2003, another landmark case in the Supreme Court, Lawrence versus Texas, there were actually some still some sodomy laws on state books. They decided that sodomy laws Laws against sodomy were unconstitutional. There's still some issues. LGBT mothers and fathers have been denied custody of their children. Teachers, soldiers have actually lost their jobs. The goals of the movement in general are to repeal discrimination laws, gain more access, reduce homophobic beliefs. The military this was controversial back in the 1990s, was that military would just as soon kind of push the issue under a rug, and if uh, don't ask, don't tell, then gays would then maintain their active duty as long as they didn't come out as being gay, but this was repealed in 2011. And currently, there are two Supreme Court cases that are looking at same-sex discrimination in employment, where people were actually fired for being gay. Same-sex marriage did come around fairly quickly, as I have mentioned, in 1996, the year that the Defense of Marriage Act was passed, only about 26% of Americans were in favor, and that represents an increase of because approximately in 1988, only about 11% of Americans were in favor. So you can see it's spiked up a little bit there. And then by 2011, increased uh, to 53%. So that's a pretty significant increase in a relatively short period of time as far as awareness and acceptance of same-sex marriage. The major precedents were Massachusetts Supreme Court allowed for same-sex marriage and then other states started to follow that. In 2012, the U.S. Appeals Court strikes down California's Proposition 8, which was an interesting episode in 2008 where Proposition 8 was passed that made same-sex marriage illegal. It was driven by anti- gay groups, particularly religiously leaning groups. But as soon as it got passed, people kind of looked at it and said, what, how did that happen? And so the courts got involved fairly quickly, struck that down. And then the two major Supreme Court cases that pretty much resolved the issue as far as same-sex marriage goes, U.S. versus Windsor in 2013 overturned a key part of the Defense of Marriage Act. There was a gay couple in New York State that were legally recognized, a lesbian couple recognized as being married. But when one of the partners, when one of the when the spouse died, the surviving spouse 
could not get her Social Security benefits because the federal government did not officially recognize them as being married. So they took it all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled in their favor. So the federal government recognized that state's same-sex marriage. It wasn't quite done yet because states still had the option to make it illegal. And then in 2015, Overveld versus Hodges was actually a case of four states that had banned same-sex marriage and took it all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled against them and says that, that bans on same-sex marriage are unconstitutional, so that resolved the issue as far as states being able to outlaw it. Stigma still exists. There are still discrimination, as we've talked about, but those legally, those are some major landmarks. The newer LGBT movements are aiming for a broader, more diverse, united front, getting them together. But as we've talked about around the world, still a lot of discrimination. Russia makes it a crime to be openly gay. There's laws against gay, being gay in over 30 African states, lots of homophobia and anti-gay beliefs still prominent in there in that area. The former president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, actually claimed that no one from Iran was gay during a speech in America when he came to visit and was questioned on that. Let's talk about another group, Native American Indians, People's Liberation, the indigenous movements where they had become increasingly militant early on. They were the first known inhabitants of the American region. Land was systematically taken away. They were not conducive to assimilation to the to the Western European cultures that came over. So they were ridiculed as uncivilized and savage by the dominant Christian religion that took over. They lost their sense of identity and have been plagued with social ills ever since, such as unemployment, alcoholism, suicide. Those rates are considerably higher amongst the Native American indigenous peoples. And quite a bit of that remaining population had been pushed off into reservations in the western part of the United States. So when the Western European expansionists came over, they had enormous advantages. That's how colonialism worked. We, we talked about that a bit already. First conquest of the region, then political dominance of the region. Some examples of indigenous plight, Aborigines in Australia. So in the early 1900s, for several decades, children in some cases were taken from families of what was considered a doomed race. There was a formal apology in 1997, not considered to be enough, rest request for funds, somewhat similar to repar reparations that we've talked about before. There was a compensation fund that is considered still to be lacking. The U.S. did also make a formal apology to the Native American indigenous groups in 2000. The American Indian Movement, AIM, still, still in existence, seeks to reclaim their identity and remove meaning stereotypes to respect as individual and respect for dignity as a people. Another liberation ideology is with theology, religious movements. Religion has served to unite a lot of people. In some cases, it's also been a source of conflict and stifling of creative thought. We touched on several aspects of that. Liberation theology has to do with using the religion to start to attend to the poor and the oppressed. The Roman Catholic Church has been one of the biggest non-governmental organizations in the world as far as helping poor people around the world. 
black liberation theology has been embraced to try to help the discrimination of blacks. And this is where the religion is used to go beyond what their traditional religious goals were to perhaps, in some words, combine the teachings of Jesus with the philosophies of Marx, move from rituals and sacraments more to helping people live their lives, particularly people that are oppressed or poor, underprivileged, not being served by market systems, whatever that may be. So it's talking about consciousness raising to have the advocates of these liberation theologies to live among the poor, teach awareness of change, and that poverty is a result of systematic oppression. So what we're doing is infusing religion with political action, looking at things even environmentally because of where poor neighborhoods are located, discrimination, lack of opportunity. This is also ties in with environmental justice, which we'll be talking about later on in a separate lecture about ecological ideologies. Oppression of a certain group is often internalized as a way of life that you've been raised to deal with this or to put up with it. We also know that religion has often been criticized even when we talked about Karl Marx, considering religion is the opiate of the masses, that it deflects attention from improving your life on this planet by being preoccupied with the afterlife and then maybe even accepting your plight until you can go on to a better life in the beyond. But what the liberation theology is doing is trying to turn that around and say, let's use religion now on this earth to make life better, to unite all Christians, in this case, if it is a Christian liberation movement, from injustice, exploitation, and indifference. One more thing where people are becoming more in tune with animal rights Lots of different inspirations for this, but abuse of animals or spectator sports, such as particularly bullfighting, had been subject of much criticism. And several groups, such as American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, those groups have been very influential in trying to get out more awareness of treatment of animals. We also see that certain animals have become popularized in the public consciousness, such as baby seals being beaten for coats, the testing and confinement of, of animals, whether it might be perfumes or, or medicines or things like that. Recently, the International Court of Justice ruled against Japan for continuing their whaling industry under the guise of research and testing purposes. So this idea of speciesism to where humans are the superior species is being questioned through this these animal liberation movements. Looking at other things such as factory farming, which are worsening the conditions for the animals that are being farmed, even eating meat being questioned, going vegan in order to improve the, envir improve the environment or perhaps even improve your health rather than raising animals for the process of eating meat or hunting animals for that. And then we've seen an increase in animal protection laws as a result of these types of liberation movements. So we've talked about quite a mixed bag here in this chapter, touching on several groups and their liberation movements. The next lecture, I want to extend this a little bit and talk more about the politics of identity groups, particularly ethnic identity groups, which are the major source of conflict in the world at this time. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail in the next group.